by the Student Association Lisa, by the College Alumni Association, and by the Beta Omega Chapter of Beta Phi Mu, honors the former deans of the college, Bill Summers, who is now the dean of the School of Library and Information Studies at Florida State University, and the late Wayne Yenowin, who was the first dean of the college. It's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Mrs. Marjorie Yenowin, who has come back to Columbia to be with us this special weekend. Marjorie, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> right. We're delighted to have you with us this weekend. It means a lot to have you back in Columbia. Bill Summers would like to have been here also, but family responsibilities make it impossible. He was here, as you know, in December and gave a splendid, humorous overview of the history of the college. I talked to Bill yesterday and he asked me to give his best regards to all his friends and colleagues and the alumni and uh, everyone attending the lecture and to express his regrets for not being able to be with you. The Dean's Lecture provides us with an opportunity each year to remember our past and to reflect on where the college is going in the future. It reminds us of the spirit of innovation and risk-taking which has been a characteristic of this college since its founding. Innovation in such areas as the professional seminar or the pro-sem, in distance education utilizing television delivery of classes within South Carolina, and in this our 20th year, the expansion of our program by satellite transmission to West Virginia and Georgia. I came, as most of you know, from UNC, or Brand X as many of the faculty <laughs> like to refer to it. In Chapel Hill, there was a group of close friends known as the Chapel Hill family. It was the family's custom to begin auspicious occasions with a toast instituted by one of its members after she made a trip to Russia. That family member just happens to be our speaker tonight. The toast, which begins with, Dear Friends, is delivered with much gusto and many gestures. And Marilyn, this is indeed a Dear Friends occasion. A conventional introduction for Marilyn would go something like this. Dr. Marilyn L. Miller, a native of Missouri, received the BS degree in English from the University of Kansas and the AMLS and the PhD degrees from the University of Michigan. After extensive experience as a librarian, she joined the faculty of the School of Librarianship at Western Michigan University. In 1977, she became an associate professor at UNC Chapel Hill and in 1987, she became chair of the Department of Library and Information Studies at UNC Greensboro. She has served as president of two divisions in ALA, the American Association of School Librarians and the Association for Library Services to Children. Currently, she's serving as the president of the American Library Association. However, those bare facts don't give you a true picture of the Marilyn Miller that I've known for the past 16 years as dear friend, colleague, traveling companion, co-conspirator, chief party arranger, and fellow lover of UNC basketball, cats, and mysteries. Dear friends, please join me in welcoming the president of the American Library Association, Marilyn Miller. Congratulations on the 20th anniversary of the College of Library and Information Science. I'm very honored to be a part of this celebration. I'm uh, honored because, of course, of my dear friend Fred and a colleague I admire very much, Augusta Baker. And I'm not going to list the other people here that I've um, grown acquainted with over the years, both in the South Carolina Library Association and the college faculty, because I'd be sure to leave someone else. It's dangerous. But I do feel comfortable about being here this evening and celebrating with you. I've enjoyed my presidency. Um, I've had many good moments. 
uh, traveled five foreign countries, 25 states by the time I finish. Lots of different kinds of groups. I'll even be going up into the mountains of Tennessee in a couple of weeks to meet with a small friends group. And uh, those things are, those activities are very rewarding. The things I haven't enjoyed very much, I'm going to publish in my memoirs <laughs> in detail and make you pay for them. But it's been a um, distinct honor to represent the American Library Association, now 56,000 members, actually 55, 824, but I have the power to round it off, <laughs> with our very rich honorable history and tradition of service to the public, and thus to our country and its democratic institutions. And of course, I've met such smart people. Librarians are really smart, and I'm going to tell you a story tonight about a South Carolina librarian to demonstrate <coughs> what I've learned. It seems as though there was a man who had three children. He knew they were intelligent, after all they were his children, but he didn't know how smart they were. So he wrote a codicil to his will that instructed each child to put a thousand dollars in the coffin upon the occasion of his funeral. Well that sad day came and uh, at the funeral service, the eldest child, a doctor, got up very ostent ostentatiously, took out a thousand dollar bill and went up and laid it on his father's hands and said, here daddy, you know I love you. And the second child got up, a lawyer, took out ten one hundred dollar bills and went up and laid them across his father's hands on top of the thousand dollar bill and said, here daddy, you know I love you too. Well the third child was a school library media specialist here in the state of South Carolina. And she got up and thoughtfully and reverently walked up, and stared down into her father's face, pulled out her checkbook, check for three thousand dollars, put it on her father's hands, took the 2000 and said, Daddy, you know I love you. <laughs> Tonight I'd like to share with you a few of the remarkable events of the past 50 years that have led us to the threshold upon which we stand today a threshold of a new world of information services enhanced and shaped by new and constantly emerging technologies. I will conclude by discussing two of the major challenges or opportunities that I think we all face as we plan to deliver those new services in the 21st century. Whatever information I provide or opinion I offer, if I leave you with anything to think about this evening, I hope it is the idea of the importance of working in community. If we are going to develop to our potential as librarians and contribute the best that we can to the development of library and information service and thus the profession, we must work in association or community with others of like commitment. Archibald MacLeish, poet and staunch believer in freedom of the mind, described it well when, as Librarian of Congress between 1939 and 1944, he said, librarianship is one of those activities which can be a job, a profession, or an art depending upon how it is practiced. If it is a job, you get paid. If it is a profession, you give it your life. And of course, that's what I might add here, is what I and many in this room have done. We have given it our lives. 
Libraries and I have just come through a remarkable half century of library development. At mid-century, America was still thought of as a largely rural society. Many states had state librarians, but the majority of these jobs were archival in nature, providing reference services to legislators and having no clear developmental mission for public or other libraries throughout the state. There were some outstanding exceptions, New York, Ohio, Maryland, and several of the southern states, especially Louisiana, where a Carnegie grant to the State Library in 1925 made possible the first demonstration of service to people countywide. It served as the foundation for the nationwide rural library demonstration of the 1950s, as well as providing a model for larger than local services in several states. Up through the 1950s, though some high schools, especially urban ones, had quite adequate school libraries, they were almost unknown in elementary or middle schools. At mid-century, in the period following World War II, a whole new world began for libraries in America. Education for librarianship came into its own with the first master's degree program in 1947 that replaced the narrow concept of training and overriding absorption with organization, classification, and making do with insufficiency. A new profession was being shaped, one intent on linking a wider circle of users with their inherited culture, as well as the fast-growing world of technical information. Education emerged as the most essential right of all the rights that excluded minorities began to fight for. The Brown decision, decision of 1954 outlawed segregated public schools. The Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1957 and thereby proclaimed the superiority of their scientific training and learning. The first disclosures were made that many adult Americans were illiterate and that not all children were learning to read either. The thousands upon thousands of rural people who had uprooted themselves and gone north for war jobs found that they were ill-equipped to find new jobs in the post-war economy in which technology required not only literacy, but also the ability to apply higher order thinking skills. The unskilled jobs they could take were largely in the inner cities, where with low education, low literacy populations grew enormously. Library's big transformation came in 1956, when the first federal money ever allocated for local public library support became available with the Library Services Act. Two years later, in 1958, came the National Defense Education Act with funds in Title II that could be used for books and other school library resources in certain subject areas. Also in 1958, the National Library Week program, a year-round effort despite its name, was launched by the National Book Committee with the cooperation of ALA. A celebration of libraries, reading, and intellectual freedom, National Library Week was at the same time an occasion to highlight deficits and state what libraries required by way of resources. More funding was required if libraries were to reach out to more people in all segments of society, build coalitions, and expand the public vision of what libraries could be to all people. Libraries struggled to catch up with this expanded vision of mission as presented by professional librarians' leadership, a mission that quickly did become the public vision of libraries as well. By the 1960s, libraries were on the front line with other agencies, 
trying to provide for the needs of people who had not previously been library patrons. Millions of people who had been excluded from the good life came in from the sidelines to demand their human, civil, social, economic, and education rights, which depended more often than not on access to information and help in applying it to their lives. The rural LSA became the Library Services and Construction Act in 1964. Its mission broadened to include urban library programs. New buildings were built and more new publics came to use them in new ways. School libraries became school library media centers with emphasis not only on book and audiovisual materials, but on a new instructional role for the library media specialist. Many school children in elementary schools and their teachers experienced library service for the first time as the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 provided a large infusion of dollars to develop elementary and junior and then middle school libraries. The Higher Education Act of that same year helped to improve college libraries and also authorized educational grants for librarians and grants for research and demonstration. College and university libraries grew in new ways with more attention to the needs of undergraduates, many of whom upon entering college were found to need considerable remedial literacy education. <clears throat> when more than a decade of innovation and development came to an end for libraries in 1969, the fact became clear that equalization of education and economic opportunity and with them the development of libraries were to be halted. Maintenance budgets were eked out through the 1970s. All this was in direct contravention of the national policy concerning library and information access to the American people which had been in the making for more than a decade. With the support of both political parties, both houses of Congress, and the executive branch. This policy is clearly stated in Public Law 91-345, the National Commission on Libraries and Information Science Act of 1970, which was signed into law by President Nixon in that year. Fortunately, much of the point about the potential of libraries and information services and their essential nature had been made by years of highly professional effort to demonstrate libraries at their very best. Congress and state and local officials found some funds somehow, though the foundation era, era for library development was ended, Millions of people had been infected with the library. And the first White House conference in 1979 provided a sounding board for public support. Libraries could never again go back to where they had been. The genie was out of the bottle. Although we have hung in at bare subsistence levels for a decade, and although we're a little bit frightened today at what we're seeing happen across the country, we now must continue to act strongly and persistently to remind the American public of the intrinsic role libraries and librarians perform in our society. Millions of people are counting on our leadership we received a vote of confidence from the White House Conference of 1991, which voiced the support of even more non-library connected citizens than the first conference. Before we look ahead to the challenges of the rest of the 90s, we need to remember that we, 
and those who have gone before us in the association, in association, accomplished all this with fewer members, fewer staff, fewer financial resources, and far fewer allies than we can call upon today. We have come so far in such a comparatively short time, raising libraries on the national agenda and making them a national issue, requiring national support, that we cannot now and we will not now be relegated to the status of well, nice but not necessary, as is implied by local option. Listen again to Archibald MacLeish speaking as the gathering storm of World War II struck when he noted that libraries must be active, not passive agents of the democratic process. And I would remind you tonight that libraries are the only institution in the United States capable of dealing with the contemporary crisis in American life in terms and under conditions which give promise of success. Libraries owe an affirmative obligation to the people, and the people have a right to such service because people today are demanding to be plugged into the power source for information, inspiration, and empowerment. And librarians have always risen, as I've tried to point out, to these tremendous challenges. We are fortunate in having three very distinct library service, library systems provide access to information in our country. The academic library system serves the research and teaching needs of higher education in community colleges, four-year colleges, and universities. Some of the greatest libraries in the entire world are those university and public libraries designated as research libraries. The public library system serves the general public from cradle to grave, welcoming all who wish to use its resources. The public library system has been well defined as the open university of the people, the protector of a democratic society because of its insistence on open access to all ideas and recorded history. The third and latest system to develop is a system of school library media centers. Up until the past two years of economic disaster, this system has been well accepted as integral to the school program and has been fairly uniformly established in most of our 90,000 schools and served, according to the latest government statistics, 4 million K-12 students each week. The philosophy of the school library that we've built over the past 30 years is that staff and a variety of library resources are basic to the successful implementation of a viable instructional program at all levels of schooling. And people do use their libraries. If we look at only our public libraries, we find that public libraries are the most efficient of the nation's public services and serve 66% of American residents with less than 1% of our tax dollars. In 1988, the latest year for which is, data is available, we spent something like $15 billion on horses, horse racing, and veterinary bills and services for horses. By way of contrast, we spent 
something like $6.4 billion on libraries. Americans borrowed more than 1.4 billion items from 15,169 public libraries in 1991. Books and magazines, records, video and audio tapes, toys, games, computer software. Libraries save business leaders, scientists, and engineers an estimated $10 billion a year in information resources. In a survey of business owners in Tulsa, the library ranked the number one agency for helping new manufacturers get started on the road to success. In 1990, 75 percent of all American children between the ages of three and eight had visited a public library in the past year. Forty percent of those children in the previous month. Six of ten adults reported using a library in 1991. Library use in this country continues on the rise with circulation of juvenile materials up by over 54% and adult materials by 10% in the last 10 years. Americans ask their librarians more than 222 million reference questions each year. <clears throat> Our library facilities, and I hope that isn't where's, I hope that doesn't include where's the bathroom and where's the pencil sharpener? Our library facilities, including our initial efforts to use technology, our philosophy of service to all, and the leadership of our profession are the envy of the world. I know this to be a fact in several countries because just this year I've talked to librarians in India, China, Poland, and Russia. And they talk as we talk, have talked for the past half century, that libraries with access to information are the keystone to research and development, are the strength of a democracy, and are basic to university education and literacy. In other words, as David Penniman noted in a paper recently, libraries are strategic to the fabric of any society, as well as strategic to the fabric of the institutions in which they reside. Now to the two major challenges we will face in the coming decade in this profession. One major challenge, of course, is the integration, use, and management of information in an age dominated by technological advances in computing and telecommunications. Within relatively a very few years, we have seen such tremendous changes in information technology. Paper is no longer the main information storage medium. We have moved to microfilm, magnetic, and optical technology. We have moved from a time where we could store only a few hundred characters per cubic inch. We can now store billions of characters. And we can transmit billions of words per minute via those glass fibers. It is predicted that 100 trillion words per minute is within our reach. I was in O'Hare this fall and I sat down next to this man <clears throat> and he was talking to his companion. And I thought, this man is talking one trillion words per minute. We don't need it. 17 years ago, we did not have microcomputers, handheld calculators, touch tone phones, much less cellular phones commonly installed in cars. Last year, a man in Guilford County, where I live, went into a ditch 
when he tried to use his car fax machine off his phone. I thought that was, that was some kind of poetic justice, don't you think? <clears throat> Voice-activated computers, lasers, distance learning, computer as we're talking about it now, computer workstations, artificial computer-generated reality that projects the user into three-dimensional space called cyberspace are commonplace now in our vocabulary and our planning for the future of information delivery. We can now install telephones that instantly translate foreign languages. Futurists promise us video cameras the size of a postage stamp, available for less than $50 by the year 2000. That might be the cost of a postage stamp by the year 2002. I hadn't thought about that. <clears throat> Such tiny cameras, it is predicted, could make possible the use, the development of inexpensive video telephones or robots with visual capabilities. Fred, I want a robot. <laughs> I have five cats. Think what a robot could do for me <laughs> with the litter pan and letting those cats in and out 1,000 times a day, picking up the newspaper. The laptop computer is considered dead by some, very quickly to be replaced by little computers this size called the notebook. <clears throat> One of the most interesting among the world future society, 10 most thought-provoking thought forecasts, and I'm throwing this one in because I don't have a wife. And I thought others of you who don't have wives would appreciate this. <clears throat> Grocery stores may soon deliver orders along routes and leave the food in refrigerated mailboxes that shut automatically to be opened by a coated plastic card. <clears throat> These changes are having and will continue to have a formidable impact on all types of libraries. The perceptions of libraries are changing and the future of public and academic libraries is being heavily debated, including by, by in, including some members of Congress. Technology advancements have placed librarians on the edge of a double-bladed sword. We must embrace technology for what it does effectively, efficiently, and profitably for the user. At the same time, libraries are still the repository of millions of pieces of paper we call books, and which we have treasured for over 400 years as the simplest, most convenient, portable, useful, and democratic way to, provide, to record our history and development. And these pieces of paper, books, journals, and newspapers will remain a mainstay of libraries and the free flow of information for the foreseeable future. They must be preserved managed and made accessible with integrity. At the same time, and with decreasing funding and increasing prices for print resources, librarians must move forward wisely into the electronic information environment, including, which includes being a marketplace of rapid obsolescence systems incompatibility, lack of standards, user unfriendliness, and dazzling applications that may have little practical use and less appeal to the majority of the masses of non-techie information seekers. Several weeks ago, I saw a demonstration of American memory, a truly remarkable project of the Library of Congress. The library has mounted many of its early Americana collections of postcards, cartoons, films, recording speeches on laser disc and CD-ROM. It is being tested in 44 academic, public, and school libraries and online in Colorado. 
the user can browse in these fantastic resources, pull together a collection of political cartoons, hear recordings. I heard a uh, Teddy Roosevelt's sister make a seconding speech for Warren Harding. Uh, well, we all make mistakes. I wonder what she'd think now. They can... I never know who laughs or grins at that when the Republicans or the Democrats. Uh, <clears throat> they can move through the great collections of the library, print copies, create bibliographies. But as this project demonstrates very well for the librarians who go to see it, the librarian's task of managing access, focusing on delivery of information, and the education of users to become competent in all of these new technologies and configurations is indeed awesome. And usually public librarians nod when I talk about the generation that is a part of our library user group that is frightened of technology. They don't want to use the automated card catalog. I had a friend call me from California. She's on uh, the board, county board of directors for the community college system. <clears throat> and she said, uh, what do you know about community colleges? Well, I have found that as president, I know a lot more about everything. Uh, and I blithely say, oh, yes, I'll talk about this or that or the other and hope someone will help me ghostwrite a speech or give me some information. Anyway, I s said, well, I was truthful. She was a friend and wasn't an audience. And so I said, well, you know, I can tell you some general things that are happening with electronic uh, <coughs> information access and delivery and some of those challenges and problems. But why don't you go to the library? She said, I can't. I said, why not? I said, they haven't. You know, you've paid all your fines, haven't you? <laughs> she said, I can't. I, I'm, afraid of the card I'm afraid of that automated catalog. I said, oh, Marie, come on. Uh, she said, well, I am. And I said, well, the librarian would help you. And she said, well, and this is the answer that we all hate to hear. She said, the librarian's too busy. And I said, aren't you using that library at all? And she said, well, if it's a book, I'm sure they'll have. I call them, and they save it for me. That way I don't have to look it up. And she said, sometimes if I'm really desperate, I go down after school, and I lurk at the card catalog, and the kids help me. I said, Marie, that's not a good idea to lurk at the card catalog when the kids come in from school. And so we, we had this conversation. But this is not an, a, a unique uh, problem. We have a lot of, of user education to do. I like to, I like to tell this story, though. Um, <clears throat> we also can not be afraid of the technology when we don't want to. My mother, we had a terrible time as microwaves came in and, you know, the library, the radios with their chips and the remote controls and all that. She, she really had a, a tough time. Uh, and she used to tell me, you know, I just feel like I, I just can't do anything anymore. So one night I came home <coughs> from school. We were living in Chapel Hill. And she said, I want to tell you, I saw the best movie on television today. I said, oh, you did? She said, yeah. She said it was about, she said it was about the erotic adventures of this hooker who moved, <laughs> Fred knew my mother, of course, so I appreciate this, and, and uh, she said that all these adventures as she moved from San Diego to Chicago. And so the next night I came home and I had another movie review. And this went on. And I thought, my poor dear mother here, this age with all this access to information. <laughs> and I read in the Chapel Hill newspaper one night that 300 homes were mistakenly receiving the Playboy <laughs> channel. So I read this aloud to Mama, and you know what she said? 
She said, don't you fix it. <laughs> well, it is really a sign of our time that evolution and revolution are simultaneous challenges to us. Because all at once, we realize more poignantly than ever that libraries are not fixed assets. Technology will continue to force us to invest in ever more costly equipment and changes, and it will motivate us to be politically aggressive. For all at once, the number of players in the information world is suddenly greatly increased. Information is now seen as a commodity, one that can be sold and delivered in the home, the car, the supermarket, where everyone can have a phone, a television, a computer. One can have an information-rich environment and some money to pay for it. But the provision of these commodities can be extremely expensive. Politicians, psychologists, engineers, behavioral scientists, telephone executives, computer specialists are now all deeply interested in how information networks and systems will be developed for the 21st century. Publishers, both large and small, are joining what sometimes looks like an information frenzy in a new, for them, highly aggressive way. I suppose there are even some ar archaeologists and anthropologists who are ready to move forward to study us if the predictions of our demise are allowed to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. <clears throat> the world once dominated by the library, the world of information acquisition, Storage and retrieval and dissemination is becoming highly attractive as money, power, and influence become identified with information. All a crowded field, crowded with, with new kinds of players, and we need to be playing in that big time for very big stakes. And if you want to see what I mean, Keep watch on the ensuing days, weeks, and months as ALA continues to debate the Library of Congress Fund Act, which outlines a fees charging schedule for the library as it becomes more determined to become a publisher itself. Watch the continuing debates on the Paper Reduction Act. The definition of <coughs> the budget department of a document as paper, only paper. The GPO access bill, which will give the public free access to government information. And watch the machinations that will lead finally to the creation of the NREN. If librarians are not watchful and do not create allies carefully, the American public will lose open and relatively inexpensive access to the staff of life on which resides our democracy, information, and knowledge. <clears throat> For what purpose do we fight these battles? Do we do it to protect our jobs, our high-paying jobs? Do we do it to preserve a way of life that we enjoy in the world of books, information, and ideas that we find comfortable and comforting? No. We fight these battles because as librarians, we know that we provide equity of access. We stand as champions for all, rich or poor, who need access to history and to contemporary reports and narratives so they may live their lives as educated, productive citizens, parents, business people, and scholars. Librarians are community leaders who empower community residents. And this is the second challenge we face, dealing with change 
first, and the second is managing that change to empower users. How do we empower? First, to approach each person as an individual, not as a member of a race or ethnic group, a particular culture or neighborhood, and be ready to facilitate the search for spiritual nourishment, intellectual stimulation, coping skills, and information alternatives wherever we work with people. It takes not making assumptions that a particular person, because of superficial markings, could not be interested in any area of human experience or imagination or be able and desirous of learning. It takes ability to accept change without fear. Efforts to empower those who are stretching the wings of their personalities and intellects for the first time through exposure to library resources will require involvement of the entire library staff. We need to remember that we are trying to help people to use the whole range of resources on which to base their opinions, their decisions, and their lives. We are offering them enhancement of how to be, to see, to feel, to hope, to aspire, to understand, and to relate, as well as help in learning facts, processing information, and keeping their jobs. It will take constant self-development and self-empowerment by librarians to be able to empower others, to find out who's out there, not once but on a regular basis, and to monitor how close we are coming to the goals we established. It will take commitment to accept and to describe ourselves as activists who will press for funding to do our jobs and for recognition and respect for the importance of what we do. Let me leave you with three examples of how librarians or information specialists have made a difference. Multiple sclerosis affects the body, but the mind can remain active the degenerative disease recently confined one Denverite to his home. For years, he'd wanted to research certain historic scientific discoveries. Now he had the time, but he lacked the means. He needed expert assistance in locating articles in journals and newspapers. What's more, he required the help long distance. The Denver Public Library's magazine and business science government departments organized a method to fill his needs. He calls in with references and staff members dig out the originals. They make photocopies and mail them directly to the customer. The interlibrary loan office is spreading the search beyond Denver when necessary. At the Denver Library, as in many other libraries, most other public libraries. Customer service applies to all people who can benefit from the library's resources. Library employees know the multitude of resources available without charge to the public. The librarian's role is often to be the conduit between customers and information. Sometimes when assisting someone who has an emotional stake in the outcome, librarians must be private eyes with hearts. Again in Denver, social sciences librarian Marilyn Chang calls her specialty genealogy of the present time. In reality, she operates a kind of missing persons bureau. Marilyn helps customers find old school chums, adoptees locate natural parents and girlfriends NAB former sweethearts. She combines demographic data such as age, occupation, and relation <coughs> with imaginative leads, old moving company records, or first trying to find the guy in the back row of 
school class who knew everybody's business. Search and recovery can take 10 minutes or 10 years, but she reports that the satisfactions are worth the effort. One woman seeking her mother came to the Denver Public Library after paying $5,000 to a private investigator who came, who came up with nothing, Chang recalls. I referred to a city directory, and five minutes later, she had her mother on the phone. Now remember, libraries change lives. And last but not least, brownies were invented when a librarian from Maine forgot to add baking powder to her chocolate cake. Undaunted by the flatness of her failure, she cut the cake into squares and had an instant hit. Her name, by the way, was Brownie Shrimp. <laughs> <clears throat> There's much to be done in a rapidly changing and explosive world. We are charged with an important mission as librarians and information specialists. As our communities continue to become more heterogeneous, and the demands grow for a well-educated, productive citizenry, our need to empower is enhanced. As technology changes and systems emerge, which allow more home-based delivery of information and networks, our creativity and commitment to the role of librarianship will be severely challenged. Librarians have always risen to the challenge, and we will continue to lead as we work to empower the nation to the extent that we learn to cooperate and work in association to meet our goals. Thank you. Marilyn, we're really grateful to you for being here and for offering your insights into how the future is going to look. You've laid down challenges for us, and we certainly in South Carolina will try to meet them. Thank you. Thank you. We have one other important piece of business to take care of tonight. Pat Feehan, would you come up to the podium, please? Somebody better take care of the camera for you. <laughs> Pat has served the college with great distinction these past two years as the chair of the 20th anniversary committee. She's poked and she's prodded and she's pulled all of us along. She's maintained her equilibrium while all around we're losing theirs. I suspect that in the annals of anniversary celebrations, this has been one of the best planned and executed ever. There are many people who have been involved in the various activities that we have enjoyed so much this year but it's been Pat who has been our leader. So Pat, on behalf of the college, Lisa, the Alumni Association, and Beta Phi Mu, gives me great pleasure to present you with this token of our appreciation for everything that you've done. Thank you. <laughs> you may open it. Please open it. And in keeping with uh, with this, Pat instructed me just before we began to be sure to invite everyone to come Saturday. Okay. <laughs> and more. <laughs> This is almost as long as the anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pat. <laughs> oh, isn't it beautiful? Oh, it's beautiful. Stained glass box. Thank you. Oh, open it up. Oh, open it up. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs>
That's it. <laughs> that is it. Don't forget, tomorrow we have a full day. We have memorabilia and exhibits over in the college, which you'll see a little bit later tonight. We have storytelling at 1.15 tomorrow. We have the Beta Phi Mu initiation uh, at 2 o'clock. The unabashed librarian string band is going to perform at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. A number of our alumni uh, with uh, uh, Bob McLean are going to uh, be serenading us over in, in Davis College. And then from 7.30 to midnight tomorrow night, the Sugarfoot Strut, including at 9 o'clock, 20 great minutes in 20 great minutes, a musical history of the College of Library and Information Science. So I hope that you'll all be able to join us tomorrow. and. For the short term, please join us over at Davis College for a wine and cheese reception, and there you'll have an opportunity to talk further with Marilyn and uh, to uh, continue to celebrate our 20th anniversary. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.